Hello and welcome to Advocate, a podcast channel by ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights, or APHR. On this channel, we're delving into some of the most important human rights and democracy issues affecting Southeast Asia. And if you like what you hear, please check out our two earlier series, Parliamentarians at Risk and ASEAN's Rakhine Crisis. My name is Oliver Slow, and I'm APHR's Media and Communications Officer. Welcome to our third series, Anatomy of a Coup, and episode one, The Coup Makers. As much of the world knows by now, on the 1st of February 2021, Myanmar's military grabbed power in a coup d'etat, arresting senior government officials, including State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi and President Win Myin. Shortly after, a state of emergency was declared, and all legislative, executive and judicial powers were handed to Commander-in-Chief of the Myanmar military, Senior General Min Ong Lai, ending a brief period of quasi-democracy in the country. The military and its proxy, the Union Solidarity and Development Party, had disputed the results of the November 2020 election, alleging unsubstantiated voter fraud. The vote had been won resoundingly by the National League for Democracy. Since then, Myanmar has been plunged into chaos. Within a day of the military's power grab, government workers led by doctors launched a widespread civil disobedience movement in order to make the country ungovernable by the junta. Since then, it's been joined by bank officers, dock and railway workers, and many others. And the movement, known locally as CDM, has effectively managed to stall trade and brought the economy to a standstill. Younger generations who'd sampled a taste of democracy have also organised mass nationwide protests. As things currently stand, however, the military's coup remains incomplete. Since it doesn't have control of key government institutions, nor is it recognised as the country's legitimate government by the international community. The military, known as the Tatmadaw, has responded to the protests with its tried and tested method of brutality. For two months now, it has committed murder, beatings, torture, arbitrary detentions, enforced disappearances, looting, while imposing media blackouts and internet shutdowns. Its actions could amount to crimes against humanity because of their widespread and systematic nature. At the time of recording, more than 2,700 people have been arrested and at least 543 killed, including children, and that figure is rising on a daily basis. In this series, we'll be taking a close look at the major players in Myanmar's current environment, including the coup makers, those resisting the coup, and the external influences. We'll be speaking with a range of people, both inside and outside of Myanmar, to try to better understand these players' mindsets, interests, and motivations, with a view to identifying measures that can put an end to the military's chaotic rule and ensure that democracy and the will of the people prevail. We'll take as balanced and measured a view as possible but make no secret of the fact that we hope that democracy is the winner in Myanmar. And we reached out to institutions known to be aligned with the Tatmadaw, but didn't hear back. So first, let's look at the country's most powerful institution, the Tatmadaw. Running over two episodes, the first part unpacks the institution of the Tatmadaw, how big it is, how it views itself, and how it funds itself. In the second episode, we'll delve into its historic pattern of violence, and talk about how the brutality we are currently witnessing it's just the latest in a long line of oppression and state terror it has meted out against the Myanmar people. Thanks for listening. That's the sound of Myanmar's military on March 27th of this year commemorating the 76 Armed Forces Day in Myanmar, the moment in 1945 when the Burma army switched allegiances from the Japanese to the Allied forces, contributing to their victory during the gruesome Burma campaign of World War II. This year's event witnessed a military parade in the purpose-built capital, Naypyidaw, attended by a handful of foreign dignitaries, including from Russia and China, while at an evening gala dinner, a bizarre drone image of a saluting Min Ong Line was blasted into the night sky. While these ceremonies were taking place, Min Aung Lang's troops were engaged in a campaign of terror and violence against the Myanmar people. On that day, his forces killed more than 100 people nationwide. This included a 13-year-old boy who was playing with a friend in the streets of Yangon and a 10-year-old girl in the eastern city of Molomyain. The March 27 violence was the bloodiest day so far in its crackdown against the huge protests that have swept across the country 
since their February 1 power grab. The man in charge of those troops, Min Ong Lai, a short, sometimes bespectacled general who became commander-in-chief in 2011, replacing long-term dictator Tan Shui. You've probably heard of the name Min Ong Lai before, and for good reason. In 2018, a UN fact-finding mission called for him to be investigated for the crime of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes for his role in leading campaigns of violence against the Rohingya and other ethnic minorities. Here's the FFM's chair, Mazuki Darasman, delivering the report's key findings. We have drawn conclusions that we never expected would be as grave as they are. What we have found are not only the most serious human rights violations, but crimes of the highest order under international law. Minong Lai was born in Dawei, a usually picturesque town in the south that hugs the Andaman Sea, but one of many beset by violence by his troops since the February 1 coup. He graduated from the Tatmadaw's Defence Services Academy, its sprawling military school in the centre of the country, before spending the next several years working his way up through the military, including a stint leading one of its notorious light infantry divisions, the 44th in Mon State, before taking the top job in 2011. So why would he and his army stage a coup, you might ask? After all, the military already had entrenched economic and political powers through the 2008 constitution it drafted. The insular nature of the Tatmadaw means that only the generals know the real reason for that, but a number of theories are doing the rounds. Here are a couple of the more plausible ones. Firstly, in the eyes of the Tatmadaw, the NLD had got a little too big for their boots. In 2011, the year Minong Lion became commander-in-chief, his predecessor Tan Shui handed power to a quasi-civilian government, led by the diminutive Tain Sein, another former general. Tain Sein initiated a series of reforms that included the release of thousands of political prisoners, improved freedom of the press, and enhanced economic opportunities. This was part of the military's so-called seven-step roadmap to democracy, or rather euphemistically its disciplined flourishing democracy. Key among this was the 2008 constitution. The charter may have been part of apparent moves towards democracy, but the document itself was anything but democratic. It contains a clause granting impunity to government and military officials for their actions prior to 2011. Military appointees are granted a quarter of all parliamentary seats, while the army also controlled three of the most powerful ministries, namely home affairs, defence and border affairs. The reforms were initiated to distance the junta from China's influence, at the same time granting the military international legitimacy, while also ensuring it still holds on to the real levers of power. However, the military's strategy didn't account for the widespread popularity of the NLD, and in particular its leader Aung San Suu Kyi. In the 2015 general election, the country's first free and fair vote in decades, the NLD won a resounding victory, swallowing up three quarters of the available seats, rather than the majority of parliament. Aung San Suu Kyi was constitutionally barred from the presidency, but effectively sidestepped that clause through the creation of the state councillor role. When at the end of last year the NLD enjoyed an even more resounding victory in a general election, it is likely that the military was surprised by their performance. The party had indeed faced considerable criticism during their first term in power for the slow pace of reforms they'd initiated. So perhaps unhappy that their slight loosening of power was at risk of running out of control, the men in green returned themselves to power. But then there's Minong Lai's own personal ambition. He's long been known to cover the country's top job, as in the presidency. And the 64-year-old was due to retire as commander-in-chief later this year. Shocked by the USTP's dismal showing in the 2020 election, and aware that time was running out, did he crudely step in and take power purely for his own gain? Or could it be that the Myanmar army truly believes that they're the sole saviour and protection of the nation against foreign influence? After all, the Tatmadaw has long been suspicious of outsiders. In a white paper it published in 2015, it said, quote, Some powerful states are now interfering with internal affairs of the smaller nations by using democratisation, human rights and humanitarian grounds as a pretext to influence on geographically important regions. The truth probably lies somewhere in between the three theories. And to better understand this final point, in particular its mindset as the nation's great protector, we'd need to look back through the Tatmadaw's history. This is the Gaumont British News, presenting the truth to the free peoples of the world. The triumphant campaign in Burma has brought everlasting glory to our fighting men who battled their way against almost impossible odds 
Today, except for a few isolated pockets... The first iteration of the Tatmadaw was the Burma Independence Army, or BIA, established in 1941 with the assistance of Japan as part of efforts to overthrow the British when World War II reached Burma's shores. In 1945, though, the BIA switched its allegiance from the Japanese to the Allies. The leader of the army at the time was General Aung San, the father of Aung San Suu Kyi. Three years later, the Union of Burma was established, ending more than 60 years of British colonial rule. But immediately the new government and its army were plunged into a series of civil wars against ethnic armed groups, a communist movement, as well as a Mujahideen group operating in the West. Around this time, the Tatmadaw was generally regarded by the public as working for the nation's best interests. But a drastic change occurred in 1962, when the head of the armed forces, Ne Win, launched his own coup, plunging the country into isolation under his disastrous Burmese way to socialism, a hybrid of Marxism and xenophobia that would put the Tatmadaw at the apex of nearly all the country's institutions ever since. Nguyen also introduced policies that further entrenched the domination of Burma people over the country's ethnic minorities, a process known as Burmanization, an issue we'll look at more closely in future episodes. Since Nguyen's days of rule, the Tatmadaw has regarded itself as always, always above the political system. They believe that you know they are always above the whole political array and ideology, and they are the only uh, holistic uh, political ideology of the nation state. This is how they positioned themselves for quite a while, ne- nearly more than two or three decades. That's Amaratiha, a research director for the Myanmar Institute for Peace and Security, a non-resident fellow of the Stimson Centre. He's been studying security forces in Myanmar, including the Tatmadaw, for the past eight years. He explains why it's important to look back to understand the Tatmadaw's mindset. It's, it's all about the historical interpretation, right? I mean, the history is all about war and how the historical interpretation of the state. So, and then you know, they try to interpret how they build the nation and how they identify and how they create the nation. It's always based on the war. When, when, when you're looking on the, on the Tatmadaw's interpretation, you know, the whole Myanmar history and the modern Myanmar history is based on the World War II and the formation of the BIA and B, BDA and then later become the, you know, uh, Tamara. The BIA and BDA were earlier versions of the Tatmadaw. So there's a two step in there. The first step is, you know, uh, until mid 90s, you know, they always seeing, you know, the, the, the General Aung San is the father of the na- nation state and the father of the army. And then Ne Win is the second person who tried to, you know, p- make it more consolidate all these powers and all these things. So they consider Aung San should be the number one all the time, but Ne Win is always number two. Yeah. Up in the middle of 90s, they tried to extend the history from the modern history towards more 11th century. This is how they tried to say that no, Tamaror is an institution that exists before the modern state, and then before that, you know, Myanmar nation is based on the historical interpretation of Bagan. So this is how they're trying to link themselves with the warrior kings, and this is how you see the three warrior king statue in the in front of the Defence Service Academy and also in Ipidot. The Bagan reference relates to the start of the empire of King Anoyata in the 11th century, which is regarded by many as the start of the Myanmar nation-state. A 10-metre-high statue of Anoyata, alongside those of two other ancient kings, loom over the military parade ground in the nation's capital, Nepal. This is how they try to say, no, we are the institution, and we go through the different crises in the different phases of the Myanmar history, and all these Myanmar history are part of our identity. And throughout the time, we are the guy who bring all the success and glory, and then this is how we protect and build this nation since 11th century. So this is how they try to, you know, interpret and create the protector and the na- creation of the nation state. Amaratiha said the shift in the military's thinking, or perhaps its propaganda, occurred in the 1990s, not long after the huge anti-government demonstrations of 1988, which saw Aung San Suu Kyi emerge as the leader of the country's pro-democracy movement. Richard Horsey, a long-term analyst and observer of Myanmar, agrees with the assessment that Tatmadaw views itself as the sole protector of the nation. The Tamador has always seen itself as the kind of saviour, protector of the nation, the institution that is holding the country together against centrifugal forces, the only institution that can guarantee the nation's stability and sovereignty. That's a view that was baked into the Tamador's psyche uh, at independence. You know, it was, it was born as an anti-colonial independence uh, army. That was really its, its, its founding belief. And over the decades, as it increasingly wavered from that nation protection stance into a much more abusive interaction with many different parts of society at different times, 
it continued to instill that belief in soldiers that they were protecting the nation and protecting sovereignty and, and preventing chaos and disorder. 1988 is also when the Tatmadaw drastically increased its military operations. The Tatmadaw was always a light infantry force, a lot of manpower, lightly equipped to deal with jungle warfare, fighting in the, in the mountains and, and jungles of Myanmar. And the Tamador, that sort of psyche, didn't see its permanent state as being at war with its own people. It, it believed that it was and it aspired to become the defender of the realm, a, a popular uh, institution as it had been at its founding and at independence, a popular institution that was protecting the country and, and enjoyed popular support. And so successive commanders-in-chief, and particularly Minong Hlaing, have talked about transforming the Tamador into what they call a standard army. That is not a light infantry force that fights rebels on its own territory, but a well-equipped modern armed forces that can maintain force equivalents with other countries in, in Southeast Asia, for example. And so they, they invested a lot in, in training and equipment and purchasing radars and, and fighter aircraft and a submarine now and, and, you know, have aspirations for a blue water fleet. All of that stuff that, that takes them quite far away from jungle warfare. And they were part the way down that transition, in fact, when fighting re-erupted with the Arakan army in a very intense way a couple of years ago. And now the demonstrations across the country uh, are really, I think, testing their, their capabilities. So what about the Tatmador's capabilities as a fighting force? Give or take, the Tatmador has an estimated fighting force of about 350,000 soldiers, according to Tony Davis, who has spent the past several decades researching security and defence issues across the region, including Myanmar. The vast majority of those, about 300,000, are part of the army, with the rest under control of other small units, such as the navy. So that's simply in terms of numbers, but you can never judge an army simply by the number of guys, girls wearing boots, right? Uh, a lot of it depends on how the army is organized and the structure and the capability in terms of weapons. Well, as a, as a fighting force, the Tatmador have always been two things. One experienced to the point of exhaustion, right? Because they have never stopped fighting in one theater or another around that country for 70 years old, right? So they are extremely experienced, extremely, I'm talking the combat formations here, right? They're extremely experienced, they're extremely battle-hardened um, in, a, in a way that no other regional force can begin to compare. However, on the flip side of that is that the Tatmador is, as I said, they're experienced to the point of exhaustion. Uh, and, and that translates into a lot of the atrocities that we've seen in, in well, throughout, not just in recent years, but essentially throughout. They're overstretched in terms of the numbers that actually can fight, as distinct from uh, support elements. They are challenged by poor logistics, lack of air support, and up until quite recently, pretty inadequate equipment. Their capabilities, however, have dramatically increased in the last decade or so, particularly since Min Ong Lion took charge and tried to develop what he called a standard army. In recent years, the Tatmador has acquired new equipment in the form of helicopter support, armoured personnel carriers and air support. Some of this has been in the form of improved domestic production capabilities. But much has been bought from other countries, most famously, at least historically, China. Yet in recent years, according to Davis, the Tatmador has diversified who it buys its new toys from, and one country in particular has emerged as an important player. We'll let Davis tell you who that is. Largely Russia, helicopters, gunships, MI-17, transport helicopters, Russian, ground attack aircraft, Russian, interceptors, Russian. So the Russians now are the go-to guys in terms mainly of the Air Force but also in terms of equipment on the ground. What's good about Russia is that you're dealing with a arms producer that produces and has produced for decades really robust equipment at 
inexpensive prices compared to what you'd pay for the similar sort of equipment in the West. And also, Russia, unlike China, is a very long way from Myanmar. So it has no geostrategic dog in the game, right? And of course, the Russians are happy to benefit from this new cornucopia in Myanmar. Let's not forget that the Russian military delegation, which included its deputy defence minister, was granted top billing at the Tatmadaw's Armed Forces Day Parade a few weeks back. One must wonder what was going through his mind when Min Aung Lai displayed to him the makeshift weapons, in the form of catapults, motorbike helmets and discarded beer bottles his security forces had confiscated from protesters. The Russians are, right now, the favoured beneficiary in terms of the modernisation programme. China, much, much less so. And in fact, the sort of overall directive, as I've been led to understand it, is China last. If we can get it somewhere else, let's go somewhere else, not China. Given the Tatmadaw's famously opaque nature, it's difficult to put an exact figure on the amount they've spent on enhancing their military capabilities in recent years, but it's clear there's been a drastic increase in the last decade or so. So where exactly do they get this money from? Well, let's take a look. Since its very first few days, the civil disobedience movement has launched boycott campaigns against military products, such as Myanmar beer and mobile operator Mitel, and there's a reason why. The Tatmadaw has huge business interests in the country, notably through its two conglomerates, Myanmar Economic Holdings Limited, MEHL, and Myanmar Economic Corporation, MEC. In its report, the UN Independent Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar identified 106 MEHL and MEC-owned businesses in a range of sectors including construction, mining, manufacturing, insurance and tourism, and a further 27 companies closely affiliated with the conglomerates through corporate structures. Chris Sedotti, a member of the Fact-Finding Mission, told APHR the Tatmadaw's business interests are essentially what keep them operating. That they provide much of the money that the Tatmadaw spends. Certainly the Tatmadaw gets a lot of money out of the state budget, around about 13%. But in addition to that, uh, it gets these enormous sums of money uh, out of its business interests. We don't actually know precisely how big they are. We've seen various documents that indicate um, very substantial income being generated by the businesses, but we don't know the exact figure. Uh, and we don't know all of the businesses that they own. Uh, when the Fact-Finding Commission in 2019 looked at the, uh, the, the network of businesses owned by the Tatmadaw, we were able to identify two major holding conglomerates, Myanmar Economic Corporation and Myanmar Economic Holdings Limited. Um, each of those own a major bank, um, and each of them, well, combined, they have something like 150 subsidiary companies that we were able to identify. And our view was that we were only scratching the surface. Um, we do not consider that we've identified all of the Tatmadaw owned and controlled companies. So it's, it's very big. Uh, in some sectors, like the gem sector, it is the dominant actor. Um, it's been estimated that around 90% of the gem industry is owned or controlled by the military. Uh, in other sectors now, there are major private sector competitors. Um, and that's good, and that should be, that should be built up. Um, we have not advocated uh, a complete economic blockade of Myanmar. On the contrary, we have urged greater investment and more economic activity by foreign corporations in Myanmar, but not with the military, with the private sector. Um, our recommendation strongly two years ago was complete economic disengagement from the military, and that still needs to be done. Another group that's been working to expose the military's business links with international actors is Justice for Myanmar, a covert group of activists established in early 2020. Their campaign aims to collect evidence and expose the business networks funding the military in Myanmar and pressure these companies to divest from their partnerships. And it's already had some success. Within days of the coup, Japanese brewer Kirin announced it was severing its links with MEHL. Since 2015, Kirin has had a joint venture with the conglomerate through its Myanmar Brewery Limited and Mandalay Brewery Limited operations. In a statement, Kirin said it was, quote, deeply concerned by the recent actions of the military in Myanmar and therefore had no option but to terminate their contract with MEHL. Yadana Mong, a spokesperson for Justice for Myanmar, told APHR the organisation would continue targeting other companies that had links to the Tatmadaw. For security purposes, we've used a voice actor to read out her response. The Myanmar military has managed to maintain political and economic control of the country through the military-drafted constitutional regime that entrenches their power and privilege, 
allowing them to gain access to unrestricted funds from a vast network of military-controlled businesses. Through their sophisticated network of holding companies, private companies, shell companies, and crony companies, in some cases denying or obscuring their deep ties to business, the military controls and influence vast portions of Myanmar's economy. MEHL is headed by Min Ong Lai, the coup leader. The coup leader responsible for the brutal and lethal crackdown on peaceful protesters is the head of the patron group of MEHL and one of the biggest shareholders overseeing business interests throughout Myanmar. He has abused his power and benefits from the total impunity of the military to enrich himself, senior members of the military and their families through the military-linked corrupt business empire. The coup places urgency for businesses to reassess and reconsider their partnership with the Myanmar military as they gun down people in broad daylight while inflicting a campaign of terror by raiding houses and arbitrarily arresting people at night. The Myanmar military has built immense wealth through partnerships with domestic and international businesses. This wealth fuels war crimes and crimes against humanity, and this horrific cycle must be disrupted. The military are like a cartel. They amass wealth through their vast network of businesses and collude to improve their profits and dominate the economy while inflicting terror against the very people they profit off. We must work to deprive them of their profits and resources and together work to dismantle the military cartel. As well as their monumental business interests, the Tatmadaw has also managed to remain in charge of Myanmar for several decades by way of another approach systematic and often horrific violence against its people. The world has been shocked by the images of brutality emerging on mobile phone footage from Myanmar in recent months, but the methods security forces have resorted to, including point-blank executions and firing indiscriminately at random civilians, are sadly nothing new for much of the population, especially those living in the border areas. And we'll look more closely at these issues in the next episode. This episode of Anatomy of a Coup was written and produced by me, Oliver Slow, with editorial input from Elise T.A. Dagoset, with thanks also to Long Su Quinn. APHR's work is also supported by the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, SIDA, the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Open Societies Foundation. This series is part of APHR's new podcast channel, Advocate, which addresses some of the most important human rights developments in Southeast Asia. Please listen, share, subscribe and review wherever you get your podcasts. Future episodes of this podcast series will be available in the coming weeks. And for more information about APHR's work, please visit our website, asianmp.org. Thanks for listening.